Hello, good crowd. We're excited. We've got Damon West with us. He's an extraordinary individual who's had a remarkable life from which we can all learn some lessons. Uh, D Damon has spent time in prison, is a recovering addict, and uh, wants to share his story with us. So stick around. You don't want to miss this. Welcome to the Your Mark on the World show with your champion of social good, Devin D. Thorpe. Please support the sponsors who made this episode possible, including Johnson & Johnson's Caring Crowd and goodcrowd.school. Damon, welcome to the show. Hey, man. Thanks a lot for having me. How are you today? I threw up fine, and we're thrilled to have you. Damon, share your story with us. Tell us a little bit about your background. Devin, I think the, most, the best thing to do is to start off at a really important date in my life, and it's July 30th, 2008. And um, I'm sitting around Dallas, Texas at the time, and, and I'm in my early 30s at this point. I'm 32 years old, so I'm on this little old dope house that I live in because at this point, I'm a full-blown meth addict. And I've got my meth dealer, this guy named Tex, sitting next to me on this couch, this little ratty old couch. And I'm passing this glass pipe with this meth in it back and forth to this meth dealer. And I'm, I'm telling Tex, that's the guy's name, is Tex. I'm, Tex, I think the end is near, man. I think the cops are going to come get me pretty soon. You see, about 10 days before this, this guy had been doing all these burglaries within Dallas. They called them the Uptown Burglaries. This guy named Dustin had been picked up by the Dallas Police Department. He was my partner in crime. And so they're putting the screws to this guy. I know it's just a matter of time before they get to me. And just as I pass the pipe back to Tex, I hear a window shatter off to my right. And tumbling across my living room floor is this little canister going end over end. And Devin, it starts to register what's going on. It's like a slow motion reel from a movie, man. As I, I get up off this couch and I get over this thing and bam, flash frame grenade goes off in my face. You know, bright white light, loud noise, blows me back on the couch, man. And when, when I came to, when I can see and hear again, this cop in full SWAT riot gear, man, he's got his boot on my chest and the barrel of a machine gun is digging in my eye socket. And, and the bar Devin, the barrel's cold. I can feel it up against my eyeball. And his finger is hovering above that trigger and that, that cop starts screaming at me, don't move, don't move. Man, I looked up at the guy and I, and I blinked and I was like, man, don't worry, you know, don't worry. And, and cops started flooding into my apartment one after the other. And, and I heard one of them scream out, we got him. We got the uptown burglar. And man, Devin... It doesn't matter how much good I can do in this life, how much I can put back in the stream of life and, and how much I can be like a coffee bean. And I'll tell you the story of the coffee bean in a second. It doesn't matter all those good things I do. I'll never be able to escape that moniker, that name, the Uptown Burglar. You see about a dozen other meth addicts and myself, young and old, male and female, black and white, and everything in between, Devin, because drugs don't discriminate. Addiction doesn't discriminate. It doesn't care who you are, what, ra what race you are, what sex you are, who your mom and dad are, your socioeconomic status. Addiction affects everybody the same way. But we indiscriminately as a burglary crew and without reservation broke into the homes of dozens of people in the uptown neighborhood of Dallas to feed our insatiable meth habits. But on July 30, 2008, those uptown burglaries came to an end. And, and that's when they took me down to Dallas County Jail and, and locked me up. And I began the process of, a, of an incarceration that I had no idea how long it was gonna last. And I sat around Dallas County Jail for 10 months wondering, you know, hey, I can't wait to get out and get high again. And at the end of 10 months, a jury of my peers sat around and listened to evidence, overwhelming evidence of my guilt, Devin. For six days, they listened to this. Six days is a long criminal trial in Texas. And at the end of six days, man, that jury deliberated for 10 minutes on my sentence. And, and I don't know how much law and order you watch, Devin, but I mean, when a jury's gone for 10 minutes, they smoked you, man. Yeah. And uh, my book, The Change Agent, actually starts off on that date, May 18th, 2009. And that's when they bring me back in after that 10 minute break and that 10 minute recess. And they bring me back in and, and I'm freaking out because I know it's not going to be good. And, and the, so the, the judge gavels it in. Bam, bam, bam. Damon Joseph West, you are hereby sentenced to 65 years in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. And man, it took my breath away, Devin. That's a life sentence. Anything 60 and above is, is your life. That's it. Your yeah. life is yeah. over. And uh, man, Devin, and it just, it blew me away and, and because it didn't have to be that way, man. I didn't grow up from, I didn't come from a broken home. I didn't have um, a background where I had all the opportunity, love and support to be anything I wanted to be in life. Um, I got into substance abuse at a young age, uh, but I could throw a football really well. This is Texas. Uh, I was a college, uh, college quarterback here in, in the state of Texas, played uh, football, played quarterback for the University of North Texas back in the 90s. And uh, I got hurt against Texas A&M in 96. And after that, I got into hardcore drugs. Uh, somehow I graduated college in 99, moved off to Washington, D.C., got a job working in Congress. You and I 
we're talking on the break before about working in Congress, working in Capitol Hill. And, and after I left that job, I trained, uh, I went in to be a, a, a political fundraiser for a guy running for president of the United States in 2004, a guy named Dick Gephardt. Remember Dick Gephardt? Oh yeah. Yeah. So he, when he ran for president, I did national fundraiser for him all over the country. And when he dropped out in 04, I moved back to Dallas, Texas, uh, to train to be a stockbroker for one of the biggest Wall Street banks in the world, UBS, United Bank of Switzerland. And it was at that job as a broker that I was introduced to meth for the first time. And, and you know, David, I'd been doing drugs since I was 12. I'd started smoking pot when I was 12 and started drinking when I was 10. So I was into substance abuse at a young age. And, you know, cocaine, ecstasy pills, you name it. I was into all that after I got hurt in football. But meth was a game changer. Meth was a thing. It, it grabbed me. And, and I couldn't give everything up away. I couldn't give everything away quickly enough for that drug. I gave up my job, my home, my car, my sanity, my tethering to God, everything. And I went from working on Wall Street to living on the streets of Dallas. And that's when I fell in with this burglary crew. And we started, you know, we started breaking into cars first and we escalated to home, to, to storage units. Then we escalated to home burglaries. And, and Devin, I, I don't play around with this lightly about my victims here, because let me tell you what I, I took from my victims. I stole more than just their property. I stole these people's sense of security. And I don't know if they ever get that back. And that's something they have to live with for the rest of their lives. And so do I, but you know, when I, when I went into Dallas County jail, it was a, it was an experience that I'll never forget because I wasn't used to that kind of environment, but, but still I had no program of recovery, Deb, and I wasn't ready to come in off the street. And when that judge sentenced me to 65 years, that jury sentenced me to 65 years, that was my rock bottom moment. And that's the, the title of the prologue of my book, the change agent is rock bottom. And that's, when I realized that something in his life had to change, it was me. And Devin, right after I got sentenced, man, they took me into this little room off the side of the courthouse, the courtroom, and they brought my parents in and let them meet with me one last time before I went to prison. And uh, my dad couldn't talk. He was in stunned disbelief. He was, he, he was, he was stoic, you know, but my mom did all the talking. And she said, you know, baby debts in life demand to be paid. She said, you just got hit with one hell of a bill from the state of Texas. She said, but you did the things they said you did, Damon. So you have to pay that debt to society. She said, but, you owe your father and I a debt too. She said, we gave you all the opportunity to love and support to be anything you want to be in this life. And this is how you repay us. She just said, that's not going to work. So she said, when you go to prison, you will not get in one of these white hate groups, one of these Aryan Brotherhood type gangs, because you're scared because you're the minority in there. She said, you're going to have to figure out a way to survive in there without getting into a gang. She said, and you're not getting any tattoos while you're in there either. And, and Devin, I, at this part of the presentation, I'll show audiences every minute. I don't have any tattoos. I, I spent almost 10 years in the joint and in, these guys want to tattoo every inch of your body, but I'd always tell them the same thing. And look, my mom said, no, I can't get any tattoos. So my mom told me, Devin, she said, you know, no gangs, no tattoos. She said, you come back as the man we raised or don't come back at all. Wow. And so I went around Dallas County jail for the last two months I was in there waiting to get transferred to, uh, to prison, you know, to the Texas department of criminal justice. And I was asking every guy in there that had been to prison before, how am I going to survive prison? What am I going to do? And, and every man in there, Devin, white, black, Asian, Hispanic, is telling me the same thing. You're going to the worst part of the Texas prison system. You've got a life sentence, and everybody in the building you live on's got life, and you don't even come off the building for five years. Get into a gang. Make your life easy. Let the gangs fight for you. But there was this older guy in there, man, this old African-American guy named Jackson, and, and I called him Mr. Jackson out of respect. And Mr. Jackson was in his 60s. He had been to prison four or five times. He was a seasoned convict, and he was in there on a parole violation. So he a real positive guy too, though, Devin. He, he came by and checked on me all the time. So one morning he comes up to me. And he said, you know, Wes, I've been watching how you're dealing with these knuckleheads, these dummies. Talk about you got to get into a gang. He said, you know, don't listen to them. You don't have to do the gang route. He said, but he said, you need to understand what prison is going to be like. So I'm going to explain it to you. So the first thing he told me was that prison is all about race. He said, that's the way the inmates want it. That's the way the institution wants it. So don't get into a wreck over race. And he said, because it's about race, you'll have to fight all the white gangs for your independence first. He said, and if you survive that and you don't give in to their ideology of hate out of fear, he said, then you fight all the black gangs. He said, they're going to come after you hard. He said, but if you can survive all that, you'll earn the right to walk alone. And that's when he told me, he said, West, I want you to imagine prison is like a pot of boiling water. He said, anything we put in this pot of boiling water is going to be changed by the heat and the pressure inside that pot. He said, I want to put three things in that pot of boiling water we call prison and watch how they change. He said, I'm going to put a carrot, an egg, and a coffee bean. He said, so first things first, Wes. He said, if I put a carrot into the pot of warm water, what happens to the carrot? I said, well, the carrot turns soft, Mr. Jackson. He said, that's right. He said, the carrot went in. 
he said, if we care, it went in hard, but prison changed that care. It turned himself. He got beat. He got robbed. He got raped. He may have got killed. He said, you don't want to be the carrot. He said, so what about the egg? I said, well, the egg turns hard, Mr. Jackson. He said, that's right. He said, the egg went into that bottle of boiling water with that hard outer shell. So physically, the egg is going to be fine. He's protected. But inside, the egg is going to turn hard. His heart gets hard, just like the outside. He said, so if you become the egg, you are incapable of giving and receiving love. You're, you don't have heart. He said, you don't come back as someone your parents recognize. He said, what about the coffee bean? And I had no clue, Devin. I didn't know what a coffee bean does in a boiling water. And and Mr. Jackson, he said, you know, for a college boy, you're not too smart, Wes. <laughs> he said, if you put a coffee bean into a pot of boiling water, you have to change the name of the water to coffee. He said, the coffee bean, the smallest of these three things, had the power to change the entire atmosphere inside that pot. And he said, if you were going to survive prison and come back as someone your parents recognize, you have to get that coffee bean, Wes. And uh, the last thing Mr. Jackson told me before I got on that prison bus in August 2009 to be transferred to prison was, he said, Wes, I want you to go out there and go be that coffee bean. You know, Devin, that was a secret that I took with me, and, and it made me feel like everything was going to be okay, but it didn't come with a manual. You know, being a coffee bean and going into prison, it sounds great on paper, but how do you do it, Devin? I mean, how do you go into the most inhospitable environment in the world, which is in maximum security prison in Texas is about is as tough as it gets, man. It, and, and the part of prison I went to is as bad as it gets. I mean, it's, you're dealing with nothing but lifers, people that have nothing to lose, um, one of the pods I lived on in prison, where, you know, there's 48 guys on a pod. They're huge pods. They've got three tiers in them, just like you see in the movies. And there's 48 guys, and 12 of the guys on that pod have life without parole. These are guys that will never, ever get a chance to go home. They're like walking nuclear bombs. So how do you be a coffee bean? And um, that was the real test, Devin. That was, you know, how do I turn my life around in this environment and become a better man and come back as someone my parents recognize? And so – it took some time, took some fighting. First couple months of prison were brutal, man. Fighting all the white gangs, then the black gangs. Then I went to the rec yard and got on the basketball court where no white guys are allowed and earned a lot of respect out there. And then finally after that, I had one last test with a guy coming to try to rape me in the shower. And, and so the deal with that was I had to, you know, I had to try to kill this guy. I, had to, I mean, I tried to kill him. I did everything I could to win this fight. I didn't end up killing him, but I won the battle. And after they left me alone after two months, man, after the, after – Everybody saw that I was fluent in the only language you can speak there, which is violence. Uh, they, let, they left me to myself. And, and that's when I got to work on myself. And I figured out in prison that there were five ways to be in a coffee bean. And so the first way to be in that coffee bean was about your body language. You, know, you, have, you can control the mood in a lot of rooms by the way you present yourself. Your body language, Devin, speaks volumes before you ever open your mouth. And people are reading you for cues all the time. You know? So I learned that by turning on a smile, I can change the energy in a room immediately. And especially on the days you don't feel like smiling. And that's the when you really got to turn it on. And so the second rule about being a coffee bean is that I had to get up every day and work out. And I'm not just talking about physically, Devin. I had to work out spiritually, mentally, and physically every day. And it's something I have to do to this day. I can't lag behind uh, spiritually working out. And what does it mean to spiritually work out? Spiritually working out means, I mean, hey, are you tapped into something uh, that you taught? You know, are you tapped into something daily, weekly, monthly? Uh, Yearly, I mean, I don't know what your idea of a deity is, but it's a big universe out there. You know, you, you should find something. And, and do you owe people an apology? You know, what have you put back into the stream of life today? You know, how have you been to other human beings? That's your spiritual workout and mentally working out. Uh, you know, I, I, you are what you eat, Devin. And I don't think that matters what food or books or videos or websites, whatever you go to, whatever you're putting in, that's what you'll be like on the outside. So I, had, I read a lot. I read a lot of books in prison, Devin. I, read a book probably every other day because you have a lot of time on your hands. I learned two things about books in prison, Devin. First thing I learned is that I never saw a guy reading a book get into a fight. And the second thing I learned is I never saw a fight over a book. So books were safe. <laughs> books, were, books were good, man. So I read a lot of books. I was a voracious reader. And um, I tried to feed myself the right stuff while I was in there, Devin. And, and physically, I got up and worked out too. And and it was, it was through this way, this spiritual, mental, mentally and physically working out every day that I learned to get outside of myself and I, and, I, and I got into recovery. And then when I got into recovery and I got in with some of the groups at the chapel, the chapel was a real big thing for me in prison because the chapel was where I learned what the secret to life was. And I learned the secret to life by these volunteers that came into prison. And the secret to life I learned, Devin, is real simple. It's one sentence, man. It's serving others and being humble. 
servant leadership. It's, it's helping other people achieve their goals in life. And, it, and I learned that when you're helping other people, you're really helping yourself because you're putting back into the stream of life. You're putting back into the universe. And that's what the universe demands of us. And uh, I did everything I could while I was in there to help other people. Dave. And I, taught, I tutored guys, taught guys how to read, how to write, uh, got them ready for the GED test. I found ways to give back. And, and it changed me as a person so much that, you know, I became a different man. And, and one of the things um, that it brought me into, like I said, was recovery. And recovery for an addict, I don't know how much you know about recovery, Devin, but you've been around, so you've probably heard a lot about recovery. But I think every addict needs a program of recovery of some kind. I mean, mine happens to be a 12-step recovery program, but it, it can be almost anything that you find a higher power and you say, hey, look, I'm powerless over this stuff. And it was at one of those meetings that I learned what the fourth step to being a coffee bean was. And, and that's about control. Um, you know, a lot of people have this fallacy of control, this idea that they control all these different variables that go on. But really, you control four things in life. And the understanding that the only four things that I control are what I think, what I say, what I feel, and what I do. And that's it. And outside of that, I really don't have control over it. So when, when I learned that lesson in a recovery meeting one Wednesday morning in prison, I could focus on the things that I could control. And those things that, that I could focus on, I did them really well. And everybody took notice, parole took notice. And, and Devin, after seven years and three months in that maximum security prison, I came up for parole and they came to my cell and the lady from parole talked to me. She said, you know, you've got an extraordinary background. I don't see a lot of people like you, Mr. West, coming through the prison system. She said, I got one question for you. She said, if you could be remembered for being anything in this life, what would it be? Give it to me in just one word, go. And right away, I fired off at her, Devin, useful. I just want to be useful again, man. And I can be useful in prison or I can be useful out in the world. I said, but I've got a plan to go out and speak to kids and go out and share my story with as many people as possible to be a warning to some, but a message of hope to others, hope and perseverance of overcoming the greatest challenges in life. And um, they gave me my parole, Devin. They gave me on November wow. 16th, 2015, after seven years and three months, they came and said, look, we're going to give you that one shot. We're going to let you go. But if you come back in handcuffs anywhere else in this country, we'll keep you till 2073. That's your expiration date. Wow. Like a, yeah. So <laughs> they let me go. And that's when I learned what the fifth lesson to being the fifth rule about being a coffee bean was, is that your past does not define you, Devin. Your past is your lesson. You can learn a lot from your past. You can learn a lot about what not to do just about as much as what to do. Uh, your present today, that's a gift. You have to make the most of that. You have to get up every day and go get it, man. Find ways to fill your day with as many positive things as possible because your future, what you're always working for, that's your motivation. That's where your goals are. Your goal is to be a better human being, to be a better servant leader in life. How can I put back into the stream of life? I keep going back to that phrase a lot because that's my purpose. I want to find ways to be useful every single day. And, um, when I was in prison, I did my own legal work trying to get out, my own appeal. And it got the attention of this huge law firm in, in Texas, the Provost Humphrey Law Firm. And um, the owner of that firm, Mr. Walter Humphrey, told me when I was in prison, you know, you, you do pretty good legal work. He said, for a guy that's never been to law school, when you get out of prison, come see me. I got a job for you. And the second day I was out of prison, I started working in this huge prestigious law firm where I work now, where I'm at work right now. I mean, I'm in a mama lunch break doing this podcast with you. But um, that is a God thing, man. God has opened so many doors for me, Devin. And, and I mean, God has, has put so many opportunities in my life. And, and all I have to do is remember that he's in control, not me. This is not the Damon West show. This is to show what, you know, what somebody is capable of when they give up and let go and let God. So, and that's my story in a nutshell. Wow. That's, that's amazing, Damon. And we're so glad that you would be willing to share that story with us. It's a, it's really a powerful story. As you reflect back, Damon, what is your superpower? My superpower? Man, honestly, my superpower is being able to listen. Being able to listen and being – I learned how to pray when I was in prison, Devin. And my prayers <clears> – before I, in my life, I would pray for things I thought I wanted or thought I needed. But I learned how to pray in recovery when I was in prison. And the only thing I pray for now to this day is – God, put in front of me what you need me to do today for you, and let me recognize it when I see it. And that's the listening part. Um, you know, so much about life, is, so much about communication is listening. And if you don't listen, you'll always miss 
you know, the important stuff. And so my superpower today is I listen. I'm always listening. And um, going, my mom always said, you got two ears and one mouth for a reason. So, but by, by being a listener, you could find out what it is that, where it is you can be helpful, where it is you can be useful, what it is people need, pe people want. Oh, what's, your, what's your superpower? Yeah. I'm not allowed to have a superpower, Damon, but thank you for asking. <laughs> yeah, um, Damon, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Before you go, would you take just a minute and tell people how they can learn more about your book, your books, yeah. your speaking business, how they can connect with you? Right. Well, my website is damonwest.org, damonwest.org. And my first book, The Change Agent, which just came out in March, uh, is available on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, all around the country. And my second book, which comes out next week, called The Coffee Bean. And this book right here, Devin, the, the thing about the coffee bean is last summer, I go around and speak to college football programs all over the country, Devin. I mean, the, the biggest schools in the country, Alabama, Clemson, Georgia, all these big schools. So I get a phone call last summer from this guy named John Gordon, the guy I wrote the coffee bean with. And he says, Damon, this is John Gordon. John's a huge motivational speaker and author. And I'm yeah. like, John, how do you even know who I am? He said, Dabo Sweeney can't quit talking about you in that coffee bean story you tell. He said, Damon, I want to write a book about the coffee bean. He said, matter of fact, we're going to call it the coffee bean. And you're going to write it with me and we'll split everything 50, 50. He said, are you in? I'm like, yeah, John, I'm in. So, so John and I set out, and we wrote the coffee bean and it's, it's on track to be a wall street journal bestseller. I mean, just by the pre-sales alone. Oh, it's that's amazing. amazing. Just another God thing, just another God thing. And, and I'll tell you one last thing I want to share with the audience. And so we started this story out with May 18th, 2009, the day I was sentenced to life in prison, May 17th, 2019, one year, 10 years, almost to the day, I graduated from Lamar University in their Masters of Criminal Justice program, gave the commencement speech at my own graduation on the 10 year anniversary. And the next day, at the same time that I was sentenced, May 18th, 2019 at 1 p.m., I got married, man. So I got to swap <laughs> one bad day out for a great one. So now I'm a husband to Kendall Romero and I'm a stepfather to her daughter, Clara Romero. So man, yeah, life, congratulations. Man. Congratulations. Well, thank David, thank you very much for joining, being with us today. We wish you every success in finding a way to be useful every day. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for giving me a chance to share my message, David. All righty. Let's do some good. Thank you. At Caring Crowd, we believe everyone has the power to make a difference. Through our crowdfunding platform for community health, we empower passionate people to drive real change. Whether you work for a nonprofit organization, volunteer, or want to get involved for the first time, you can post a campaign on Caring Crowd. Join us, because caring is where change begins. At GoodCrowd.School, 5% of what you pay to learn how to make a difference goes to nonprofits working to eradicate extreme poverty, improve global health, and reverse climate change by 2045. So when you take a course to learn how to change the world, you do change the world. Get started at goodcrowd.school today. Thanks for tuning in to the Your Mark on the World show, the Social Impact Podcast. Please subscribe via YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or Spotify. Spotify.